We launched our Leadership Live series last spring as a way to connect, engage, and share information with our community during this pandemic where getting together physically looks a little bit differently. And today is our first Leadership Live of the 2020-21 school year. And we are so excited to have the team of Atrium at Atrium Health, as well as our school nurses, and Mark Reed with us to answer our questions as we've kicked off our school year. While everyone is joining in, let us know that you're here. This is a conversation. We like to call it Leadership Live Conversations with Country Day. Although we're not in the conference room together or we're not in Gorelick Theater, we're still in this together. So please let us know you're here, um, your role at the school, if you're a faculty member or you're a parent maybe the division your child is in, um, so we can welcome you to the conversation. Again, this is our Leadership Live series. It's our first session, our first series of this school year, and there's really no better way to kick it off than with our partners at Atrium Health, along with our expert nurses on campus and Mr. Reed to kind of talk about what's everybody, what is on everybody's mind as we get back to school. So really appreciate everybody's time as we kind of take some time at six o'clock on a busy day to answer some questions. Our families have sent in some questions ahead of time. So we've used that to kind of create a format for the day. But as people are logging in, please let us know you're here and then feel free to type in your questions in the chat. We've got our team from ATRAM as well as our nurses who can answer on chat. And I'll ask the, the team on camera as well. So just to give people a sense of the format for this session, this will be one hour. We'll try to be cognizant of everybody's time. Um, but if your question does not get answered, please feel free to email us at bucksnet at charlottecountryday.org and we'll make sure we get you to the appropriate person. Like I've always said, we're in this together and there are a lot of questions, so we want to make sure that we're here for you. We, this session, this kind of format, there's only four people that can go on the screen at once. And we have about six or seven on, um, on deck to talk to you today. Our two school nurses, Wendy and Liz, we've got um, a couple doctors from Atrium Health, as well as Ruth, who's here with us on the screen, um, as well as another member of Atrium Health's team, Grady Hardiman. So I'm gonna be kind of just, as questions are coming up, I'm gonna be putting people up into the screen and then back down kind of on deck as questions are kind of coming up. So thank you in advance for your flexibility with the technology. Just a reminder, this will be recorded and it will be on our COVID website as well. And it'll stay on our leadership, on our YouTube live page. Um, so you can reference it and send it along to people who may be interested in the conversation. Shannon, yep. we, um, we certainly as a community need to offer a huge thanks to you for all of the work no. you and the communication team is doing to uh, and continues to do to uh, to get the COVID websites up to help with communications from all the divisions, and certainly from myself. So I certainly want to thank you for that. I know you don't ever take credit for that, but we really appreciate all that, you, that you're doing and that you continue to do. No, well, I appreciate it. Well, yes, I was going to say, I absolutely do not do it alone. Leanne Black and Natalie Pruitt are rock stars on my team and are have been stay, keeping really busy because we know how important it is um, during this time for clear communication. So right. thanks a lot, Mark. Um, so again, as everybody's logging in, we've got a handful of people. So remember to let us know you're here. Give us your name and your grade level so we can say hi um, to Millen Davis's mom and Meredith. Um, thanks for being here today. So we're going to get started. Our first kind of topic is really big picture about the department. Um, speaking of communications, I know we send a lot of emails. So there was an email went out a couple weeks ago, kind of launching this partnership. But we thought we'd take this some time and allow um, you to ask some questions and have Mark and Ruth kind of talk big picture about how this partnership came together and what it kind of looks like. So, uh, you know, Ruth, let me give a quick introduction. She is, she's got a long title, so bear with me, Senior Vice President of the Population Health Division at Atrium Health. 
She oversees the development and implementation of value-based care models across the organization. She's also a proud parent of a country day senior, so we love to see that connection. Ruth, I cannot tell you enough how grateful we are for your leadership on developing this partnership and your team has just been great as we've been working with the emergency planning team. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know I speak for all of our faculty and staff as well. Do you want to just give us kind of a big picture sense of what this partnership looks like to get us kicked off? Sure. Good evening, everyone. And, and thanks, um, Mark and Shannon. Um, I am honored uh, to be with all of you this evening. We at Atrium ha Health are grateful for the partnership with Charlotte Country Day as we navigate these uncharted waters. So we're all learning together. And Atrium likes to be um, identified as a learning organization. And I can tell you I've been in healthcare 30 years this year, and I've learned more in the last six months than I probably have the, the 29 years before. Um, as a parent of a senior, uh, I am a parent of a senior, I know the importance um, of the return to campus for my son's mental, emotional, and a physical health. And I can tell you he's having a really good time and um, fell asleep after school today. And I understand that that same impact um, is, is felt by all of our children across the Country Day community and quite frankly, the greater Charlotte region, we all want our children back in school. It's where they grow and learn and blossom the best. We are taking our best knowledge and the learnings that we've had over the past six months and working with our own teammates. We've got 60,000 uh, people that we work with every day in more than 50 companies and really facing it towards the school community. So how do we do what we do in healthcare and in businesses and face it towards the work that we're doing with our children, um, the faculty, and the staff at Country Day? Our goal is to, about to develop programs, tools, and resources um, developed and shaped by all of you, our Country Day family, that will allow our children um, and the children to, to learn and engage in a campus setting. So how do we get kids back to school? And then share the learnings that we have across the broader atrium footprint. I want to thank you again for your willingness to partner with us. We know um, that's not easy in a time of uncertainty. And we are excited to walk along the journey with our Charlotte Country Day family, with the faculty and the staff um, for this upcoming school year. So thanks for allowing us to be your partner. Thanks, Ruth. Mark, do you well, want to hear from your perspective, kind of how this, um, anything to add? Yeah, so when I think back to March of last year, and I think back to, to starting kind of to deal with, with this pandemic and having really to rely on CDC, uh, MEC, uh, Gov, who, are, who have been great at trying to guide our community, but not specific enough to really answer the kinds of questions that I had and, and get the kind of guidance that I could, could trust. Um, for for a long period, for a sustained period of time, uh, it, it literally was what feels to me like a gift to, to run into a place where Atrium was willing to help us with their best doctors to think about how we might even consider bringing students back to campus. And we put our planning together earlier in the summer. We had some of these sessions where uh, we really opened it up to let folks ask us questions about our plans. And then after we put out those plans together, we, we asked Atrium to scrutinize those plans, to look at them, to tell us where they see the greatest strengths, where they see the greatest challenges, and to have us think about solutions for those things. Um, for me, it's by far the, the most challenging year um, for a head of school. And I've had conversations with heads of school all over the country and the, the sentiment is the same. You, you don't train for this. Um, you can't train for the unknown and this is the unknown. And so we're trying to do this uh, in the safest manner possible. Um, we are trying to get students back on campus where we know relationships, social emotional growth and, and the health and well-being of students on top of the educational opportunities 
come together and, and it's the way we've done it for years and years. That means it's the only way to do it, but it is means the way that, that we have done it and we've been trained to do it. And so uh, doing our best to make that possible in the safest manner is the approach we've always taken, putting students and faculty and staff first and trying to create the safest environment possible. Uh, <clears throat> if we can't do that, if we can't maintain that, then we won't be here on campus. We'll continue to educate, but we'll be here on campus. And that's part of the, the, the uh, three versions of our approaches back to school that you can find on that COVID-19 website that we sent out to everyone. Um, I will say I've been overwhelmingly impressed with the number of families in this community that signed off on the pledge. My faculty and staff all signed off on it. Um, over 99% so far have all agreed and signed off on the pledge. And there are a few folks that we think just haven't, haven't, haven't actually signed it, but have been doing the health and wellness screenings every morning. So I'm sure it's an oversight. They're going to take care of that in the next day or two. Uh, but, but that's phenomenal to get this number of members of our community to agree upon anything. Um, and that's just being honest. I mean, you know, everybody has a different approach, a different view to things, but this community overwhelmingly supported this and, and um, it's going to take that kind of Herculean effort in order for us to really be able to do this safely for any real length of time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I know something that we've talked a lot about is the development partnership part of it. You know, there's a lot that our community is being able to benefit, but we're really feeling when we look at the service aspect of it and the impact that it can make for K-12 schools in our region and beyond. Um, you know, we're really grateful to be able to partner with you guys on that as you guys make an impact um, for the broader community. So thanks again for giving us that opportunity. Yeah, there, there is no question that the learning going both ways has been helpful I mean, it, it really has been and the kinds of questions that that we get from atrium and the kind of questions we get to ask atrium um, just has been has been wonderful yeah absolutely all right well ruth thank you so much i'm going to as i said before i'm going to put you back down on deck i'm going to bring in our nurses so thanks so much for taking the time this afternoon or evening all right let's bring our nurses. Hi guys. Hi. All right. So while we are super fortunate to have Atrium as partners going through this year, we already have an incredible in-house team of nurses. Wendy Barber and Liz Grassi have a combined 41 years of nursing experience. That doesn't say anything about age or anything. They just have been doing it since they're like 10 years old. Um, they have experience in neurosurgery, trauma, reconstructive surgery, pediatrics, adult and pediatric ICU, CCU, and post-surgical care. We also have the benefit of our athletic sports medicine team that is led by Monica Erb, who has really been instrumental in this work as well as we've kicked off athletics in the summer. So this team of in-house kind of health experts is, um, is combined with the atrium partnership is really been um, really been a benefit and I know I personally have learned a lot about that health side of things uh, so Liz and Wendy thank you so much for all of your work I wanted to take this opportunity to let all of our families who are watching and going to be tuning in later know that your first stop if you have any health related questions if you have any exposure questions if you're experiencing symptoms symptoms in the household, anything at all related to that, these two women are your go-to people. We're going to put their phone numbers on um, chat. It's also on our COVID website. We're also going to create a dedicated email, um, nurses at charlottecountryday.org, so that over the weekend you can also email them and, you know, we can make sure that we are, you know, being a service and connecting with you as you guys have, as families have questions. So your first stop is go to the nurses. And then our process, which we'll share a little bit about later, will ensure that your teachers and division heads and the appropriate people in this school um, know so that we make Make sure that you're being taken care of. So, Shannon, uh -huh. Shannon, can I add one more thing? I know you didn't plan me jumping in, but I, well, I do want to 
too, I do want to, again, thank both nurses for 24-7 work on this. And, and over the weekends, once you get that email posted up, if, if you have a concern or a question, if you email them over the weekends, they can rotate on who's checking that so that they're not also working 24-7 every weekend. Um, but I don't think they signed up for that. But I want to be, I want to be absolutely respectful of that. And at the same time, we want to handle emergencies as they come. And so we want to create a balance for them in the same way we'd want to create a balance for anyone else. Absolutely. All right, Wendy, Liz, I'm going to put you back down on deck. We couldn't have a health conversation without showing you first. But we're going to bring in our Atrium Health Partners, and then we'll see you at the end. All right. All right. We've got, I'm going to actually, Mark, I'm going to also put you on deck to bring Grady in, okay? All right. Here we go. That should be it. There we go. All right. Hi, guys. Thanks for your patience. We're losing, we're learning more skills every day with some of this stuff. Um, so I'm just going to get kicked off with a, a quick introductions, and then we're going to get into the good stuff. So first, I want to introduce Dr. McCurdy, Atrium's infectious disease specialist and also a country day parent. Dr. McCurdy has really been an amazing wealth of information from back in March when we first started having the conversations about the pandemic. Um, I can't believe I wrote down that it's been six months, which is crazy. So Dr. McCurdy, thank you so much for all that you have done, even pre Atrium partnership and what you continue to do, um, you know, kind of throughout these kind of questions and for joining today. And I know you have another scheduled with the seniors um, this Thursday. So another engagement with country day. We also have Dr. Casenza, Medical Director for Atrium Health Employer Solutions. I can personally attest to the number of hours Dr. Casenza has spent, especially over the last month or so, both kind of virtually and in person, as he's been working with our emergency planning team, getting ready to get back to school. Not only does Dr. Casenza come with a wealth of medical expertise, but also a lot of experience working with other employers. So that has really been a benefit for us. So thank you, Dr. Crescenza. Thanks for being here today. And then one last member of the Atrium team we have is Grady Hardiman. Grady serves as the Director of Corporate Health and Wellness at Atrium Health Employer Solutions. Grady is our go-to person from everything from answering questions related to cleaning protocols, to walking through the exposure management steps and the, that process and literally everything in between. Um, let's just say Grady's cell phone is probably pretty busy um, leading up. So Grady, thank you so much for your flexibility and patience as you've been working with our team throughout this process. All right, so let's get started. Um, again, we've got, I'm actually realizing that our host chat our nurses are not able to answer on chat, so please continue to ask your questions, and I will answer as they, um, you know, they'll answer to me, and I'll kind of do it. We'll figure it, figure it out, but um, they're not ignoring you. There is some technology issue that they cannot focus <laughs> on the chat. Um, so the first most frequently asked question that was posed when we sent out the survey um, for questions pre preparing for today was all about exposure management and contact tracing. So I wanted, um, Grady, to give you an opportunity to kind of kick it off as you've kind of seen big picture, the planning and the process for contact tracing and exposure management. Can you just share an overview of that process? as well as some information about Atrium's exposure management tool and that Get Well loop and how it can be used um, for Country Day students and employees. Sure, Shannon. Thank you so much for, uh, for having us today. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, we're excited about this partnership. But from an exposure management perspective, you know, you guys have, have really worked really hard at, at developing a good foundation there between Wendy and Liz and Mark and yourself. Um, and, you know, 
I think we've, we've really developed a plan that, that's going to work really well for, for both students, faculty, and parents there. Um, so in the event of an exposure to COVID-19, uh, you know, the team does have a, a committee that will work together to help identify uh, those students and faculty members who are in close contact to that exposure. Uh, and then we will notify those individuals so that we can get them set up with the appropriate follow-up care and monitoring. Uh, for the 14-day quarantine period. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, we really caution against making big public announcements about uh, COVID-19 uh, diagnosis. Uh, that, that tends to cause more panic uh, quite often. So really just notifying those folks who are in a, in a close contact exposure situation and getting them the, the care that they need and the monitoring that they need over the next 14 days uh, will be the key. Um, so that's really, you know, part of the plan and working together with Dr. Casenza and Dr. McCurdy and, and all of those involved at Charlotte Country Day um, will be invaluable. And then Atrium Health also has an exposure management uh, tool that, that we can enroll faculty and, and staff and students from Charlotte Country Day in that have truly been exposed so that they are virtually monitored for 14 days. Uh, testing is automatically ordered at days four through seven. Um, and, and these individuals are monitored on a daily basis via a virtual app. And then at any point in time, if they become symptomatic or not feel well, uh, they're engaged in the appropriate care. Uh, and at the end of that 14 day period, they're given that clearance, uh, if they're ready to, to return to school and to return to work. Great, thank you, Grady. And um, I know people are kind of going through the like actual scenario. So I think Dr. Um, McCurdy and Dr. Casenza will be able to answer some questions about what if, maybe we'll just jump into it. I'm kind of going off script a little bit, but what would Dr. Casenza, let's say a student is, has um, a test positive. Can you kind of walk through what that would look like? Sure, um, Shannon, and I'll, and I'll echo Grady's comments about, you know, uh, this has been a wonderful partnership so so far. And, and as Mark said, we're learning as much from uh, our need to help you as, as hopefully we're helping you. I think um, when there's a positive, kind of the first step to try to do is retrace step. Um, people are infectious for 48 hours even before they develop symptoms, which is kind of why we like to go back two days and go through a list of who would have been in a close proximity. The CDC has an official definition of a close contact or high risk contact. The, the challenges with that definition is it's got a bunch of asterisks. Um, it, it generally starts with closer than six feet for uh, 15 minutes without PPE, but it's as little as 30 seconds if you handle the infected tissue of somebody who has COVID without washing your hands. Or, so it, it, it is a guideline, but not necessarily uh, something that you can just follow blindly. So what, what we're committed to, to doing and working with Dr. McCurdy and your team is trying to go through and say, who was that student around? Who would have been in a bubble in that within six feet? Was there an, op an, an opportunity for, for somebody to be around him without masks? Um, the, the masks do a better job of protecting somebody who's infected from giving it to anybody else, but there is some level of protection for people who aren't in, in, infected or from being protected from somebody who, who is. And then you just kind of start the process there saying, making a list of who is, is in the, the you know bubble of, of, of worrying about, and then starting enrolling them, notifying them trying to get them into the loop. And then uh, uh, those people kind of um, get a 14 day quarantine to kind of not be at school, do their, their learning remotely, and then kind of see what happens over the next 14 days. If at any time they become symptomatic, then testing should be offered um, as it would be indicated. And if they can make it through those 14 days without any symptom development, it is um, unlikely that they will at that point then go ahead to develop a uh, illness. Got it. That's great. And we got a question about the communications piece of it. I think that I'm Grady. I'm going to put you on deck and bring Mark up to kind of address some of those. Um, here we go. All right. 
Hi, Mark. Yeah, there was a question that just popped up on chat in terms of, it says, so we will not be told how many cases are present in the country day community if a person in a child's classroom is positive. We will not be told. Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about the kind of cascading of communications um, relevant to that? Oh, Mark, I think you're muted. Oh, hold on, hold on. Muted. I unmuted you. Okay, thank you. No so, problem. thanks for taking care of that for me. So, yeah, there's no intention to hide anything from anyone. The idea is to both balance people's privacy and the risk associated with uh, with COVID and, and the, the time we're spending with Atrium has been really helpful on that. We've talked through all kinds of scenarios that that uh, that would allow us to think through these situations as they occur. So are we going to post a, uh, a list of those individuals who who contracted COVID? No, we won't. But are we going to keep our community aware of, uh, of if there are cases Sure, we want we want our community to understand where we are, how safe this community is. But for all kinds of HIPAA and all kinds of other reasons around medical privacy, we won't be posting names of individuals. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. McCurdy. Is there anything you want to share from the kind of infectious disease protocols in terms of privacy and the communications that um, you can share with our community relevant to that? Yeah, I think the main thing that I would just add, and I think Dr. Kassins and uh, Mark touched on them briefly, sort of the importance of finding the balance. And the first thing that people always worry about is, you know, trying to figure out who all needs to be tested and it sort of blows up. And so I think one thing that we've learned sort of at the, the medical community, you know, in the hospital setting, and even obviously we're dealing with people out in the community as we're diagnosing folks, it's really, it, it has to be a stepwise thing. So if you sort of jump ahead of uh, sort of the, the protocol, then all of a sudden things sort of become chaotic. And obviously, we all recognize here that this is a very important topic. We're obviously uh, having our children, you know, my kids go to Country Day back on the school campus. So I have as much concern as anyone else here. But I think the main thing is, is that we want to make sure that it's controlled. And I think when we start just blasting information out uh, without sort of going through the steps, um, you know, it, it can lead to some problems that are more, that are bigger than what the actual problem is. And so I think that's in tune with also trying to keep privacy is just trying to go through those steps and hey let's really understand who was with who let's really understand who is at risk so that we can make the appropriate uh sort of steps to to keep everyone safe yeah absolutely right. um and dr casenza can you just touch base a little bit on kind of the high risk versus low risk and you know our kind of protocols that we have in place in terms of social distancing and masks um and you know when we are doing a contact tracing and those kind of questions and the medical background backdrop to that uh, in terms of the risk yeah uh sure and and you know um uh, I'll ask Dr. McCurdy to kind of jump in after I'm done. So, you know, that the, the, your policies are set up to essentially minimize any risk exposures because masking is essentially uh, encouraged at, at all times, well, well, certainly while indoors. You know, there are some situations where it's not, it's just not going to be feasible. You know, if you're trying to do PE and the child can't breathe, well, maybe that's not a situation. But essentially, um, in the, the indoors environments, um, uh -oh. operation and the the masking. So, um, if there happens to be a, a, a either in a, a sick child or faculty, you really have done a good job of minimizing who is going to be at the highest uh, risk. Um, and you've also done done a good job of even better than that is trying to screen people and keep them out before they they, they, they get sick. Um, we kind of look at these as, as your best layer of, of protection is, is encouraging sick students or sick faculty. If you think you're sick, please don't come because everything else is built on protecting us. When somebody is there, your best bet is just if they can self-identify and stay home, it's the safe thing, safe thing to do. But all the steps you've done really kind of limit the, the situation where you have somebody without any cloth mask within six feet of each other. And I think that's commendable. Wow. 
Thanks. Um, Dr. McCurdy, do you want to get the question that just popped up kind of very practically speaking, if someone in my child's class tests positive, will my child automatically be considered exposed and therefore at home for 14 days? This, this again kind of goes through, I know we've talked about it, so you know, you two kind of take this question. Yeah, so what will happen? So the answer is no. So not automatically every kid will be sent home. And so one of the things to do is assess the risk. Um, and so again, uh, not knowing sort of the grades, uh, obviously we have a, you know, JK through 12th grade school. So one can imagine that the scenarios for different uh, environments, different kids are, are different. Uh, and the ability, you know, to, to discuss with kids uh, how close they were and these sorts of things, it can be challenging. And so I think these are going to be things that, you know, we have to take one day at a time when these scenarios do present themselves. But the main thing we want to try to do is recognize what the risk is uh, as far as how close someone uh, was to another student. Um, what, as Dr. Casenza said, it may be that it's a smaller child and it is on a playground and they did have their mask off and then there's something that we need to, to you know, discuss a little bit further versus it being a 12th grade kid who was in the library uh, studying and then had some other classes, but they're six feet apart from each other and there's five kids in the class. They're very different scenarios. So we would assess risk for all the kids uh, before determining if they need to be quarantined or not. I think I'll just piggyback on what Dr. Casenza said before. I mean, I think um, as everyone on the phone call can imagine, right? Um, being 100% safe is nothing, you know, whether we go to a Harris Teeter or whether we go walk down the street to go to our neighbor's house or go to school are going to be challenging. I think what we've tried to do, Country Day's tried to do, is put in place protections. So, and I think, um, you know, staying home when you're sick, having to get wear the mask. And I can remember one of my first conversations with Mark you know, six months ago when we had this is, you know, I think more than anything, and I can say it because I'm a parent of a country day kid, is it's got to be a partnership. So, you know, we all have these situations where you may have something you need to do and your kid may or may not be sick or on the fence. Uh, kids are saying, I don't want to wear my mask at school anymore. I mean, I think, you know, we're all in this together. So as much as we can, you know, keep kids home when they're sick. Uh, if there's a question and you're on the fence, you know, we have the ability to do virtual learning, um, incorporate that in, into the kids day that day uh, until you can just sort of evaluate kids. I get phone calls every day from um, parents, uh, from friends, saying, well, they're a little bit sick today. What should I do? And my advice is always if they're a little bit sick today, wait until tomorrow, right? And so keep them home, monitor them, and see what the next day brings. And sometimes when they're not better the next day, that may need to get the kid tested. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to send the kid in not knowing if they're well or not well to see, you know, when they get home eight hours later, how does their day go? Um, so I think those are things we can do to sort of keep the, the community as safe as possible. Dr. Dr. McCurdy, th thank you for that. And the fact is, this school can remain open if we keep this partnership where people are, are really not taking the risk. If, if they're really saying, you know what, my child doesn't feel well today, got to keep them at home. If the employees are saying, okay, I don't feel well today, I should stay at home. This, this community of being safe rather than sorry, I think in the long run, will give us the best chance. And, and I can't, you know, I say we will stay open. We have the best chance of staying open and being able to serve students on our campus if people really do live up to the partnership that we've asked of them. And, and I will tell you, I have been really, really pleased so far with how many people are enthusiastically both doing the, the health app every morning to get their child into school and really thanking the faculty and staff for doing what they're doing every day uh, you know, here at the school with students. Um, it's, it's not easy for faculty and staff to get up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going into an environment every day uh, that has a certain level of risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I couldn't be more proud of them for the work that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to share the nurses were texting me since they can't chat and they wanted me to remind everybody that um, part of what they're doing for the contact tracing one, they did special John Hopkins training over the summer specifically related to contact tracing. So they've got that 
um, additional professional development. And part of the plan has been to get all of the seating charts as well as all the rosters. So we have all of that information so that we're able to, and there's like a set of 20 questions that um, they will ask during that kind of investigation, that questioning when you call the nurses. So they will ask you, do you ride the bus? Are you on, do you do it on your sports team? Who do you sit with at lunch? Um, you know, extend the day, any of the areas that there could be exposure for us to really create a personalized plan to mitigate risk, but still allow the school to function in the best way possible. So it's that beautiful balance that I've been learned, you know, I have been taught by Dr. Cazenza and Dr. McCurdy and the team and the nurses. So, um, again, I just, I do think it was a good, um, information for the families to know that we have those seating charts um and all of that kind of information so we're able to kind of create that bubble as much as possible um, yeah, and i think i think the other point to this too is um, i have not seen anywhere that can completely eliminate risk um, the nba built a bubble you know built created a bubble situation and they still had at least one case you know and and uh, i just don't know that it's that it's possible to create a perfect scenario what I do know is that we have worked with Atrium and with other medical experts, and I, I think to Dr. Sepkowitz, Ken Sepkowitz, and all the other folks who have helped us really try to create uh, a situation where we've reduced risk um, and mitigated risk as much as we possibly could. Uh, and we continue to try to adjust on that. We see areas where we say, hey, Maybe we need a sign here, or maybe we need to put um, a new message here, or maybe we need to talk to kids about this, or maybe we need to talk to kids about that. And uh, so you'll see shifts and changes. Uh, that message that I sent about being patient, being resilient, uh, being flexible, um, and placing trust in us is, is going to ring true the entire year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question while we're here right now. I'm going to bring Grady back on to talk a little bit more about some of the ways that we've been mitigating risk. He's been working with some of our different teachers and teams. Um, but there was a question about testing. Uh, back when we announced our partnership that there's some opportunities for testing with Atrium, um, so I wanted to give you guys, Dr. Cassandra, if you want to take this one and let us know, tell the community kind of what that what that means um, for our school, and um, you know, if there's any questions specifically, people can just use chat. Yeah, so sure. Um, you know, th there's there's kind of two different uh, testing approaches. One, if there is an exposure, so as Grady alluded to, the, the people that are in the get well loop, either the faculty or the students, they, they kind of get offered um, uh, and recommended testing anywhere from days four to seven. Um, that appears to be the ideal time to test somebody who has no symptoms. Um, uh, best chance of catching the virus when it's at, at a stage where you can uh, have enough of it to, to detect it. But even for those asymptomatic, you kind of have to uh, recognize two things. One, if you develop symptoms at, at day two, you don't wait till day four. You go ahead and start arranging for testing at day two. And if somebody has a negative test at day five, but they develop symptoms at day eight, then you go ahead and retest. Uh, so symptoms trump, uh, trump everything in the, in the asymptomatic exposure. Um, and then the other uh, uh, program that we have is we, we have the ability to deploy a team to do on-site uh, testing. So if there were an exposure at the school um, and it was the, the right thing to do, again, this all starts with, you know, is it the right thing to do? Uh, setting up a, a, a location, preferably outside, to minimize the risk and then, and then um, test people that are asymptomatic. You know, currently we're using a, a, a nasal swab, so it only goes in a, a short distance in the nose. Um, and then we send it to current, uh, get sent to the, our, our, our main lab where it gets processed, turnaround time, um, one to three days. It's been averaging closer to one, but sometimes it takes a little longer. And, and as we stand up a new platform, hopefully by mid-September, we'd have the ability to do results in 15 minutes once we have that, that uh, up and running and ready to go. But both of those are, are options if, if it's the right thing to do, again, with the partnership with the school to say, 
how big an exposure, how many people do we think, and then decide is it the right thing to just arrange for testing through the other atrium locations, or is it the right thing to do to send a team out and kind of try to handle it all in, in a safe and, and uh, you know, safe manner? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. I'm going to actually bring Grady in. So, Mark, I'm going to see you in a second. Okay. All right, here he is. Welcome back, Grady. Um, real quick, our next kind of topic of conversation are ways that we've been, um, that we as a school, things that we're doing to mitigate risk, and then also ways that families can mitigate risk. We had some questions around that, and Grady's been working with some of the <clears throat> departments specifically on, on things that our families may not necessarily know what we wanted to share. But we did have a question relevant to contact tracing that I wanted to make sure that we get to, and it is relevant to what if somebody, a family member of a student, is positive and how does that change anything? Um, you know, what are their steps for that? I guess Dr. McCurdy or Dr. Casenza, you guys can. Uh, <laughs> I can jump in on it. Um, so, so household contacts um, are, are typically considered higher risk exposures. Um, and so um, for folks uh, who may have a sibling or a parent uh, who are positive or a grandparent for that matter living in the home, uh, we do, uh, based on CDC guidance, recommend that those people are at quarantine at home for 14 days um, from the time of exposure. And, and so it would be ask if someone else, which is why I think um, on some of the questionnaires it asks if you've been, uh, someone at home has been exposed or had illness, uh, that those people are, are stay at home for that period of time. And, and that's just because that's the length of time that after an exposure, someone can develop symptoms. So similar to another exposure, but uh, we don't want to be uh, sending someone to school where there's a known exposure at home. So those are as a, as important or potentially probably more important actually than an exposure at school where that risk is certainly there, but a lower risk rather than living with someone where you have shared space at home. Um, and so we would obviously, if there is that known exposure at home, or frankly, if someone is at home with symptoms, uh, again, my recommendation being safe would be if a parent is home, has fever, has a cough and shortness of breath, that's not the right day to send the kid to school. Uh, that, that's a day to say, boy, something seems weird here. We might have something going on at home. Uh, keep the kid home, uh, get the parent, uh, the other household member evaluated uh, so that we're not potentially, you know, finding out two days later, oh yeah, I was sick at this point. And now that I've sent my kid to school and it creates, uh, you know, again, more questions uh, than potential concerns. But what we're trying to do is again, that use that word mitigate, right? We're trying to mitigate um, the risk of exposure we're also trying to mitigate just the concern that comes with it. Um, and so, I mean, I think the benefit and the, and the negative of Country Day is it's a very tight knit community. So as soon as someone knows that someone's got it at home and then that kid was at school today, there's going to be questions asked and parents calling and these sorts of things. So again, I think it's great that there is that in community uh, there. But I think, again, we, we all want to be conscientious. And if there's someone sick at home, keep your kid at home. Certainly if they're diagnosed with COVID, uh, then you need to stay home for 14 days. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, I'm going to jump ahead on one question um, just while we're here, and I want to be mindful of time because we won't go past seven. Um, but can we? We had a question about our kind of travel restrictions and our philosophy and thought process around not necessarily having a band or restriction. Where you know we've kind of seen others in the community. Can you guys talk about kind of the thought process around that? Sure, Shannon, and, and um, I'll answer the question real quick about whether it be nasal or oral swab. And I'll tell you, Dr. McCurdy and I sit on a variety of committees that, that cover the testing. We are looking at oral, um, but right now we are doing nasal uh, swab and have not stood up any uh, oral testing uh, platforms. Now, that doesn't mean we won't, but you know, in current state, um, it's nasal, and for select populations, they actually get what's called the nasal pharyngeal, which is a whole lot deeper. And if people have ever had it done, we call it, you know, kind of like brain tickling, although it's not very tickling. But to your question about the travel ban, um, you know, travel ban made sense early on um, to try to prevent the spread. At this point, once there's community spread, 
it's not necessarily a, a where I go, but more my behavior that impacts my, my, my risk. You know, talking with Dr. McCurdy, I could have a higher risk by going to my local Publix, not wearing a mask, you know, getting as close to everybody as I could, picking up, you know, tissues. Then if I went to Myrtle Beach and wore a mask and found a stretch of beach that was 50 feet from anybody else. And so although I traveled for one to what, what had been a hotspot, my risk was actually greater staying locally just, just by how, how the behavior that I engaged in. And so although a, a, a Good idea prior to community spread. Once, there, once there's community spread, the, the, the travel ban or, or restricting people who travel somewhere and then come come back um, doesn't necessarily make any sense. At Atrium, what we did instead of banning people from working when they travel, because you know over the summer people wanted to, to go on vacations, do those kind of things. Instead of, of, of saying you can't work, we just uh, reminded people to to engage in the correct behaviors, and when they get back, we ask them to self monitor using a symptom checker tool for the next 14 days. And if they develop symptoms, we start with these don't develop at work. That's enough to raise your hand, get yourself evaluated. But at that point, uh, don't show up if you think you're feeling uh, uh, sick. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of goes to the importance of our daily app. Um, I know you guys have been help, helping the nurses kind of come up with those questions. Um, and again, for anybody, the families who have been answering the questions and only received a go, um, the point is if any of these questions come up and you have something, it gives you a stop and your first step is to call the nurses. And then they can individually walk through that scenario with you and consult with our team at Atrium Health if we need to. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Cassenza, do you wanna talk about kind of that app and the importance of kind of daily monitor monitoring and any advice for our families relevant to that? Um. Yeah, you know, Shannon, it, it, it's it, it, there's a variety of different you know uh, apps and, and questionnaires, but they all have kind of the same features. They're all focused on kind of the CDC recognized symptoms, and also starting with "I am not feeling well," and that should be enough to say I need to stop and do something different because um, showing up um, and, and say they don't have COVID, but they have another infectious virus. At the same point, you don't want to go and spread especially in this heightened area, because immediately somebody will say, well, if it, it could be COVID. And say, yeah, the reality is it could. But I think the app starts with asking all the right questions, which is, am I having symptoms? Which is essentially, am I sick today? Am I not feeling like myself? And that should be enough. And then if not, if you go through all the questions correctly, it says, you appear to be at, at low risk, and we don't see anything here that would uh, preclude you from attending uh, school, school or, or showing up for work. So um, I think it's the first layer of defense and then everything else that you've built kind of layers in uh, following that, the mask, the social distancing, all of those are then subsequent uh, levels of protection. Great. And speaking of those other layers, um, I kind of want to give Grady an opportunity. I know he was just on the field with our PE teachers, kind of working through some of that. So a lot of things kind of behind the scenes happening. And I know there's been a lot of communication and there's a lot on our website. Um, so, you know, everything from we have gone through not myself, but the team and this emergency planning team has gone through the campus with a fine tooth comb, finding out the spaces of how to maximize our space for social distancing. There's plexiglass. We've been putting up tents outside to allow students to be outside as much as possible. We've got upgrades to our HVAC and our cleaning protocols and our screeners in the morning, this app, um, and the list goes on and on. So a lot of that is on our website, on that COVID page, on the FAQ page particularly, if anybody is really interested. But Grady, I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about um, any of those small things that might be interesting from our families, um, you know, relevant to what we're doing to mitigate risk um, during this time. Yes, and, and uh, you know, I, I did have the privilege of going out last Friday and spending time with your with your physical education staff. 
Um, and I've also heard uh, questions that have come up from, from your science teachers and your chorus teachers about singing and working in lab groups and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, we have talked about other ways to, to mitigate uh, risk and uh, obviously not, not sharing um, common items, uh, high touch surfaces, making sure that we keep those good and clean. Uh, but one of the things that we really talked about with, with both chorus and PE is, is something as simple as having an extra mask on hand. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where you're outside of physical education, you've been running around and you've been breathing heavy, uh, maybe you've been sweating and that mask has become wet and damp and saturated either from the uh, increased respiration or from sweat, uh, you probably want to put on a new clean mask before you go back in the building. So it's important to have that extra mask with you. Um, things such as just washing your hands or using a hand-based, alcohol-based sanitizer, hand sanitizer uh, before and after PE, before and after lab, um, you know, before and after changing your mask. Things that, that, are, that are that simple that people often forget about um, are important. Uh, you know, we talk about masking and we talk about how important it is, but if you're using a cloth-based mask or a homemade mask and laundering that mask on a regular basis and keeping it clean, um, as opposed to wearing the same one over and over, day in and day out without washing it. Um, I think those are important things to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, with, with physical education, uh, working with the, with the PE teachers, uh, they even have stations set up, and they're going to keep students in their own station at their own cone. Uh, and that will help with the physical distancing, but will also help with contact tracing if we need to do some contact tracing with physical education classes knowing who was in close proximity of that particular student or staff member who was COVID positive. Um, you know, we always ask that uh, they wear their mask, um, you know, but obviously, you know, there's gonna be times when they need to take their mask off. You know, you know they're not gonna have a student who's having difficulty breathing uh, because they've been running around, keep their mask on, but they may take that student to the side, distance them further uh, than they typically would uh, and allow them to take their mask off, catch their breath, get calm down, get some water, uh, and then rejoin the class with their mask on uh, when it's appropriate. Uh, so we talked about all of those things. And another another common point with physical education class was bringing your own water source, your own water bottle, especially during these hot August months uh, here in the Carolinas. Uh, it's important to keep those things in mind that while we're focused on COVID that we still have heat related illness that we have to focus on. Uh, so bringing your own water bottle source so you're not sharing water or sharing water bottles. Uh, and then uh, in terms of uh, and working in the lab, uh, you're washing your hands before and after you're working in the labs or using that hand sanitizer um, will be important. And then just going over the cleaning methods. How do we clean those high those high touch surfaces and keeping them wet the appropriate amount of time with the cleaning uh, solution so that it's actually working. So just small little granular details like that we've been working with teachers on. Great. Um, speaking of kind of masks and kind of compliance, I have to say, we have been so impressed by our community and the compliance. Um, our students have just been amazing having their masks on and our families, 90, and almost one or two families have not done the app in the morning. And then we also have our community compliance pledge. Um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. McCurdy, how helpful do you think that is in terms of kind of we're in this together and a compliance pledge and a community agreement um, in times like this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to what we're trying to do at a, at a large healthcare system as well, right? So we're very much socializing what, you know, we're calling good COVID behaviors. Um, and, and so I, I think um, having everyone in the community um, on the same page, you know, from the parents to the kids to the faculty, uh, as if everyone's trying to do the same thing um, and marching to the same drum, I think it helps. I, I think reinforcing the good behaviors, you know, at home, uh, uh, with the kids and then when they're on campus um, I know I've got three kids with two in high school and one in middle school and I think you know they've even come back and told me how you know most of the students are complying well and uh, yeah. things be going super well so and I think 
you know, as the team, you know, it's it's easy to sort of follow a team, particularly at that age and with peer pressure. So if everyone's engaged and parents are encouraging it and the kids are encouraging each other, I think, um, you know, it, it will make a big difference uh, as we sort of march into the school year a little bit further uh, each week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we did have a couple, well, there's two more questions, We're probably not going to get to the very end, so we might not be able to see our nurses again, um, but again, remember to call them, and I'm having issues putting their phone number on the chat, so it will be on the COVID website as well as Bucks Now on Thursday, so if you need anybody, or just call the school, and we'll get you to where you need to be, um, but there was a question about, um, did the child, should, when kids come home, should they take a bath or a shower right away? Should they change their clothes? Are there anything parents could be doing um, to mitigate risk relevant to that? Dr. McCurdy, what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think that's a, a necessary step. Again, I think for people who that's what their practice they want to do, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, but I think the basics uh, of good hand hygiene is probably the most important thing. So again, making sure, and again, I think it's you know, I know there's hand uh, hygiene uh, stations around campus, uh, but again, I think not a terrible idea when a kid gets in the car to ride home from the carpool, you know, to have the hand hygiene, to have the hand sanitizer there in the car for them to wipe, wipe their hands mm -hmm. down. I think those sorts right. of things. My kids have hand sanitizer in their car, and when they drive home, they, they use their hand sanitizer. So, I mean, I think those sorts of things are good. You know, again, we talk about surfaces we talk about clothing all this sort of stuff I, I really think the hands and then the you know the face are the most important thing so if people have a mask on and they're wearing their mask um, you know we do tell people when you take your mask off that's a good time to wash your hands right because there could have been something uh, on the mask or something that you know you, you've breathed uh, and so it's a good time when you take that mask off and you get in the car again good hand hygiene at that point but but I don't think it's a, a requirement certainly to, to wash clothes or take a bath right when you get home again if that's what makes people comfortable I, I think it's something you could do but certainly not something that i would recommend everyone have. okay thanks all right four more minutes two questions one is we've had a lot of questions relevant to allergy symptoms during this time and how to handle that and then the other one is is there any kind of medical research relevant to kids wearing masks all the time. Um, so those are the last two questions. So I'll kind of, you guys can split that. Um, what do you think? Dr. McCurdy, you want to talk about the allergies, symptoms relevant to COVID and how people should be handling that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question and a really hard one. Uh, so I'm not sure I have the answer, uh, but I can sort of uh, address it. So again, unfortunately, as everyone on the call knows, right, COVID can be asymptomatic kids or it can be symptomatic kids. And there's obviously a wide spectrum between those two and allergy symptoms sort of fit in there. Um, so again, I think we've got to be cautious. Uh, I think erring on the side of caution makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, it's super hard to tease out nasal congestion and a cough uh, and a post nasal drip in a kid who might have allergies every season. Um, but I think, again, if a kid has anything that seems out of the ordinary, uh, then that's the, the kid you just want to keep at home and watch. And I think with our hybrid situation, kids aren't going to school every day. So again, I think if a child were to stay home one day that they were supposed to go to school and do virtual learning, it, it you know provides two, 40 more hours at, at the minimum before they're going back. So I think it, it does provide some protection. Again, I don't think we want every single kid who might have allergies having to stay home. But I think certainly at this point in time, it makes sense. And if it's certainly out of the ordinary, uh, or well, golly, they normally don't have um, runny nose and itchy eyes and a sore throat and a cough. Sometimes they complain of a runny nose and I would keep that kid home. So again, I think just erring on the side of caution. Again, um, some people may take a Zyrtec or an Allegra or something and then their symptoms go away. Mm -hmm. It takes that on Saturday and then on Sunday night, still going, getting ready to go to school on Monday, they're having that symptom still. And they normally get better with their, uh, you know, antihistamine. And that's probably something they need to be brought, you know, stay at home, call the doctor and ask some questions about it. Great. And that brings also the point of the alternate diagnosis, Dr. Casenza, you've been talking about. Um, so you can kind of mention that as part of, uh, you know, that part of 
you know, the quarantining and that individualized conversation that we have with um, people before you get into the the mask research. Yeah, you know, as, as, as Dr. McCurdy was saying, you know, you go back to, is this something new to the child? Uh, and if it is, then you say, well, let's go get this evaluated. And then you can, if you land on a alternate diagnosis, then you can start saying, well, then does the full quarantine that you would do for COVID, uh, is that truly applicable? You have an eight-year-old that has fever and sore throat, although they could be COVID symptoms, they could be strep. So once you get the kid evaluated, you start by going, please don't show up to school, get your kid evaluated, and you come up with an alternate diagnosis, then you can say, all right, now that I have a diagnosis that is applicable in the situation, then you don't have to stay home uh, the full 10 days like you you, like you would if it was COVID. Now, if you don't have a diagnosis or you know you choose not to get care, then you probably are on the side of caution, which is, well, then I will then have to presume it's COVID and then you go the full 10 days. But, but it, it overlaps with a lot of, the symptoms are so nonspecific outside of the loss of taste or smell, which seems to be kind of unique to this. That, that you start by saying, let's get it evaluated, but you don't assume that everything is COVID, but you do start by saying, stay home if you're not well, let's get you cared for. And if you arrive at a diagnosis that then accounts for everything, then you proceed from there. I think the question about mask, Shannon, was, um, you know, if you look at the guidelines, they, they don't recommend it you wear mask if they're restricting breathing. So if anybody has a mask that is so restrictive that you can't breathe normally, you can't exercise, then probably that is not a, a, a appropriate mask. Um, there, there are indications where a mask is, is inappropriate. A child, uh, you know, is too young under the age of uh, two. Um, if you're physically exerting yourself where you can't breathe. So, um, but as for, you know, data that says the safety of this, we wouldn't be recommending this if it was unsafe, but recognizing this virus is now eight months old, I guess coming on nine. Um, a lot of data is, this is still a learning situation. Um, I see if Dr. McCurdy has, has anything to add, add on the, the, the study saying, but we're still learning even this morning. Yeah, absolutely. And again, through this learning curve, we cannot express our gratitude to you all, um, you know, anymore. So again, thank you so much for your time. Um, again, I'm going to, Grady, I'm going to put you on deck and bring Mark so he can say bye to all his families. Um, but again, to everybody, I know there were a handful of questions that we didn't get to, but please don't hesitate to email us at bucksnet at charlottecountryday.org. Like I said, um, this atrium team has been great. So we can absolutely ask them additional questions if you need. We're in this together um, and let us know. I put the nurses' phone numbers on there and um, continue to check the COVID website as well as our emails. Every Thursday, Bucks Now goes out. So updates and announcements will be in there. Um, again, your COVID website and BucksNet is your one-stop shop because I know there's a lot. Um, Dr. Senza, Dr. McCurdy, Grady, Wendy, Liz, Mark, thank you so much for spending so much time today. Um, but we'll sign off and um, I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. I think our weekly check-in is on Thursday. Thank, thank you, Shannon. All right, thank you. Bye.